shenanigans. Uh, all right. Hey. Thank goodness. Grady, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, yeah, can you hear sure. me? See me? Yep. Everything? All good. Wow, we. I, I, I mostly use Instagram to uh, look at Chihuahua videos and follow a bunch of uh, labor nurses. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Beautiful. Well, uh, well, thank you very much. Every once in a while, something like that pops up. And, uh, you know, I had a couple of things on my end here, too, that I was trying to uh, get cleared up. But this is absolutely wonderful. Like I say, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, thank you for all the work that you have been supplying to all of us, uh, you know, horror yeah. fans. So, no, bravo. that's my job. And 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 welcome to to my very anonymous hotel room in Salem. Uh, <laughs> I see. Doing I a see. Show up here tomorrow night, and this is so oh, the last okay. of six, nineteen days now, sort mm. of on the road doing this. So wow. uh, I'll be doing more shows, but this is the last one in a row for a bit. So, and now uh, this is a this is like a one man show, right? Like this yeah. is just all you. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I would rather not go to an author event, and I'd rather not do an author event. Um, and so I started doing one man shows with them. So it's, uh, it's a history of haunted houses and the economic realities of, of selling them. Um, <laughs> it's a big challenge, especially in this market. And uh, it lasts about an hour. And I think there's I do slides. I do really terrible PowerPoint, but I think there's like 130 <laughs> something of them. So it moves fast. There's, there's no singing oh, okay. this time. Usually there's songs. There's no songs sure. in this one. Um, but yeah. So now, uh, and by the way, I, I noticed someone just said, um, they're looking for a second edition of paperbacks from hell. I have always wanted to do uh, a second edition of paperbacks from hell called paperbacks from hell Two. think of the children um, and do all of <laughs> teen horror. Oh, like, uh, the point horror stuff, but um, I got to get my publishers on board. Oh so. man, that's the awesome. Man, well, I, man I, holding me I down. love that. <laughs> so as far as these live presentations, before we kind of dig yeah, into yeah. the actual interview here, you know, now the, the songs, the music that th this is all you as well, yeah. correct? You, you yeah. do all of I'm, that stuff, a real showman, if you will. Yeah. I, I try, you know, I, um, I work with this stuff. Oh, someone just said, come back to the Mahoning. That is happening. Keep your eyes peeled. Um, but yeah, awesome. I, um, I, for years worked with these guys, uh, Subway Cinema in New York. We started doing uh, these Asian film festivals because we all used to go to this, what turned out to be the last Chinatown movie theater left in North America called the Music Palace. Mm. We sort of threw our money in uh -oh. and started to see we got a little movie. buffering oh how am i back i think i got you yep yeah okay sorry <laughs> i'm on hotel wi-fi uh <laughs> okay. so but anyway so we started screening movies and someone had to introduce them and i think i wound up adding up i think i introduced a little over 1100 screenings over the 16 years Whoa. Um, and so um uh, yeah, so uh, I got really used to being in front of people. Um, so yeah, that's where the shows come from. I just figure people <laughs> oh, leave their man. house, they should be entertained. <laughs> or I should try. <laughs> Die to mine. Yeah, I love that. I love it. Okay, so so digging into this, you know, and obviously, you know, a lot of these things go into early on and they go into, you know, at, at a young age and such. And, and kind of digging into more specifics. As far as, uh, first of all, talking as far as books, uh, as a young man and, and, and a lover of, of books of all sorts, bring us back to your earlier memory of a place that really made an impression on you, whether it was a library or maybe a local store, some place that really, you know, brings you back to uh, digging into uh, your, your early memory of, of, of loving books. Yeah, well, my family are big readers. And um, uh, so we always had to take books wherever you went, like you had no excuse to be bored if you were stuck in the car or uh, at the doctor's office. Um, but yeah, libraries were huge. Um, and my parents got divorced when I was pretty young. And so I think most people who have divorced parents know you're always waiting for someone to pick you up. And so my place where I'd always be waiting was a library. Usually there was the hmm. library society in Charleston. There was the College of Charleston library. There was the medical university library where my dad worked. Um, there was the school library. So I was just always in libraries. But then the other place was, um, oh God, God, the book exchange, which was a paperback okay. swap shop. Um, 
And I read a lot of sci-fi and I read a lot of like military fiction. I didn't read so much horror. Uh, it kind of creeped me out, uh, <laughs> the covers. Um, and also they did like used comics for like 25 cents each. And so I was always reading those. Oh, and nice. so, yeah, so that was sort of my go-to place um, for a long time. So yeah, so paperback swap shops and libraries. Okay. Okay. And, and and now this, you know, may kind of intermingle in between each other throughout the interview, but as well as, as in film. Now, uh, earlier, may it be a rental shop or maybe a movie mm. theater? You know, what was local to you as opposed to the bigger chains that really bring back, you know, maybe sights or smells or uh, very vivid memories yeah. to you? You know, it's not so much movie theaters. I wasn't allowed to see R-rated movies. So going to movie theaters was really loaded. Like I had some great experiences, but for me, it was usually uh, National Home Video, which was our local video okay. chain. Um, and like, I was, I'm old. So like, I remember when we used to like, our family would rent a beach house in the summer and like, you know, and like on the way out, we'd rent like the three movies we'd get to watch <laughs> that week. And you also rented the VCR that came in this like briefcase. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, uh but um, the other thing, though, was HBO. That was really new, and my mom was oh, okay. super down on it. But my grandparents had it, and um, a bunch of my friends had it. So I'd always catch glimpses of stuff, you know? Okay. So, um, but yeah, lying in bed between my grandparents uh, when I was really young, while they were asleep on either side of me, and watching, like, Conan the Barbarian and uh, uh, Ray Harryhausen stuff, and um xanadu which was you know hbo used to show the same thing every night for a week and so i saw xanadu like 500 times so it was and conan the barbarian too um, okay. oh, and someone just asked about doing a uk show i was just over there doing last summer doing a show in cambridge and i'm hoping to get back uh Man. this fall i'm trying yeah yeah sure now i know that you had mentioned in an interview as far as an early introduction to anything creepy or movies wise was was the watcher in the woods now yeah that where, was, uh, I no, saw that. Uh, as far as that that opportunity how did that come up and where do some spookier things start creeping into uh you know what you're watching well i mean you know that was all new newspaper ads because I wasn't allowed to see the movies I but I was so I was obsessed with newspaper ads because I would try to like suck up information from them so I remember very vividly the ad campaign for the fog uh and watching oh which yeah is one of them and I think watching the woods it was pg or g I can't remember yeah. which so I remember that was a horror movie I could go see and so I, I was like begging my parents and I made up like I called I was like, oh, this movie, you guys are going to really want to see it. And then I sort of just cobbled together everything I knew my parents liked to see in movies. Um, and my knowledge was not that strong. And I, I just constructed <laughs> the stupidest movie. And I was like, yeah, you guys will love it. Um, but the other place was TV. Um, you know, uh -huh. there are three big TV movies. And, and I saw The Shining way too young when it had its broadcast debut. I'd like okay. to watch bits of it. But... The big ones were um, Don't Go to Sleep, which was a made-for-TV horror movie okay. uh, about a... Uh, yes, someone just asked. Yes, I do a show for every book release. Um, but Don't Go to Sleep, which was a made-for-TV horror movie. And um, it features, I think if anyone's seen it, a killer pizza cutter, which uh, it's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, my and, God. Uh, I remember watching that. Um, there was a, a woman, Ms. Washington, who was the nurse who took care of my grandmother who lived with us. And she and I watched that together in my grandmother's room on this uh, black and tiny, I think it was a color TV. Uh, and we were both totally freaked out by it. Um, and then the other two were, there was an episode of Little House on the Prairie where there was a kid and there was like a poltergeist thing going on and like it rained stones at one point and i remember <laughs> oh one of the God. kids looking at a mirror and it broke and it was really spooky but the real one there was an episode of the waltons um that had a girl she's an unwed mother i think and she was staying with them and she was having these hallucinations that they were burying her baby in the backyard and they were really, really creepy. They were like nightmares. Uh, and oh, I mean, wow. those really loomed large. Um, oh, and like everyone, I saw Poltergeist way too young because that was PG. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, you, and you touch on too, as far as, you know, uh, watching or seeing things on TV. 
uh, and, and very resonant with me as far as coming up and my parents, you know, a very old school reformed Christian family and sure. uh, there not being a whole lot of R rated things. The made for TV or the TV cuts of like Halloween and child's play and right around, you know, the, the Halloween time, uh, that was always a favorite time because I would, you know, be tucked in a bedroom somewhere trying to really quietly be watching it and maybe have to turn it if I can hear them coming down, but all the good stuff was cut out. So it didn't yeah. really matter. <laughs> well, but, you know, it did matter because like, or, or to me it mattered because like I was getting to participate in this thing that everyone else got that I didn't. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so I would be trying to peep and like, I'd never get to see stuff all the way through usually mm -hmm. on a, oh, my wife just joined this live stream. She's oh. out of the country right now on a job. Hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hello, man. Um, but, uh, so, but like, I was always trying to piece together the bigger movie, mm -hmm. you know, and the bigger experience from the bits I was seeing or the ads. Um, and the other thing was I was quite stupid when I was young and I never really got <laughs> TV schedules. Like if it's on at eight o'clock on Thursday this week, it'll be on <laughs> right. eight o'clock Thursday next week. So there was like a show I loved called Project UFO and I could never figure out when it was coming on. I just could not crack the schedule. Um, and so uh, I would just catch bits of it everywhere. And it, it was scarier that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I am one of those people who like, I prefer sequels um, and I like coming in on the middle of stuff. I don't really need to get the backstory or anything. I like just sort of like getting the clues and imagining a much bigger world. That's usually more interesting sure. anyways. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, does anything come to mind? I know that you've mentioned that before. Are there are there certain sequels that come to mind that you prefer over the original? Maybe you went back oh, yeah. and backtracked. Uh, what, what comes to mind with that? Well, I mean, you know, uh, let me think. So I would say that I prefer the King Kong remake to the original King Kong. Uh, oh, I saw that okay. quite young. Um, and I just, you know, it's Jeff Bridges. It's, you know, it's great. Um, I don't know what the problem is with it. Um, <laughs> I, I, listen, Alien is a very great movie, but Aliens is, is better. Okay. Um, I, if, I mean, if you want to get into Hong Kong, I'll, I love Once Upon a Time in China, but Once Upon a Time in China, choose better. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of other sequels that are really better. Oh, well, Friday the 13th part two is infinitely better than part one. I mean, like uh, nothing personal, um, but you know, Sean S. Cunningham is not the director that Stephen Miner is. And, and even though yeah, part two is really fraught with the way it treated Adrian King, the final girl from part one, um, and, and really did her a disservice in a lot of ways, it's an infinitely better movie. And I hate to say it, but Baghead Jason is the best Jason as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> oh, man. I also really like Halloween 2. Um, and, you know, it's I rewatched it. I know Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't like it because she's like, I'm just drugged the whole time. It's a waste of my character. But there's something about the way Dean Cundy shoots those hallways that's just very empty and it always it's made so an good. impression. Um, mm -hmm. And not to be a jackass, but I really like 2010, the sequel to 2001, a little bit more than 2001. I know 2001 is a masterpiece. Whoa, I'm really? Not saying it's, I'm not saying it's not, but for some reason, 2010 really, really sticks with me in a way one doesn't. Dang. Um, okay. I know, wow. I know. And I'll say, you know, I, I love Night of the Living Dead, but Dawn of the Dead is such a comfort oh, movie. Oh, dude. Absolutely. That movie is so odd. And it's one of those things where Night of the Living Dead has its rightful place. Yeah. I mean, you can't take that away from that. But as far as uh, that, or even the remake mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Tom Savini oh, directed. The remake's a lot know, of fun, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. so much fun. Yeah, okay. Well, I, and also, just to, ahead, just to continue the theme. No, 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 don't be sorry. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm just running at the mouth because I just realized I also have a huge soft spot for Nightmare on Elm Street, too. <laughs> I don't think oh, it's a bad yeah. movie at all. No. I think it's actually really fascinating. Fun. So, yeah. And Texas yeah, Chainsaw yeah. Massacre 2, I don't like as much as one. I, I think one's Oof. a masterpiece. It's great. In, in, the, in their own rights. Uh, I think it's something, too. And where I, I had heard you mention once uh, Evil Dead 2, as opposed to the original and kind of those movies. And that's always been something to me where uh, even though it's, you know, schlocky, it's very silly. I have always preferred the second and I've always loved that movie as opposed to. Well, I I think a lot of us watch two before we watch one. Yeah, and I did so too. I watched two with my friends and we loved it. And when we saw there was a one, 
um, we were like, oh yeah, and it's it's really grimy and really scary. It's actually really intense. <laughs> like I admire it, but boy, that was oof. And someone is being a pervert and and saying Silent Night, Deadly Night Two. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, I did. I that's did a, see that's that. That's a forty yeah. minute movie with, with with an hour of footage from part one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as far as as far as reading and as far as story wise and, and paperbacks may it be where you know I, I know that you've mentioned one of your favorite books being true grit mm -hmm. uh, as far as you falling in love with reading what were some of the books that initially really drug you in from just being an average reader to somebody who you really wanted to divulge into reading oh. it wasn't a choice in my family like my family oh, okay. reading. Okay. yeah I mean yeah. it's like you know, I mean, I have siblings who get in like almost physical fist fights over like the Mitford family. Uh, like, you know, it's it's really like um, intense. So that was okay. never an option. What for me was the big deal was a the library. Like when I was, <clears throat> it was right around the time. I think it was right around before, right before Reanimator came out. Um, they re-released actual. For the first time, I think for the first time, <clears throat> hardcovers of H.P. Lovecraft's collected short stories oh, with okay. um, the restored editions, because August Derleth had gone through and made tons of changes to them. And um, and the one of the great things about those being out in hardcover was that libraries started ordering them. You know, they ordered hardcover instead of paperback more often than not. Uh, just because of durability. And mm -hmm. so those were suddenly around, which were great. And they had great cover illustrations. And I remember being very into those, even though they were kind of naughty to figure out. But so libraries were huge for me. But the other big thing, um, well, two things. One is those Alfred Hitchcock horror treasuries. Um, okay. Those were amazing. Um, Monster Museum uh, has a story oh, yeah. in it by, um, gosh, I can't remember her name, um, but the man who sold rope to Knowles, uh, which is a story that just really, really yanked my crank. Um, <laughs> okay. and, uh, and then there was also, um, when I discovered that um, for like, a dollar or a dollar fifty, I could buy paperbacks at the book exchange. That's when I really started experimenting with stuff. Um, like paperback sci-fi was was really a big, big happy place for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, less so horror, but definitely those. And then you know, I, I stumbled across the way I found Clive Barker's Books of Blood was you know the best way possible, which was just we had rented a, a beach place and someone had just left two of them behind. Um, oh, and wow. that okay. was so much fun because those books are really eye opening when you're when yeah. you're a teenager, you know, um, not just because the sex feels grown up and mature. I think Stephen King sex, he doesn't like writing sex and you can kind of tell. And it's also very 70s sex. Uh, it's very, very hetero, very like um, just very vanilla. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there's always a lot of like self-loathing surrounding it. And I, I feel, um, Clive Barker, man, his characters fuck and like, they <laughs> love it. Um, and it gets kinky and, and queer. And that felt so much more like the eighties to me when I was, yeah. when I was reading them. And, you know, you've got, um, some of those stories. I mean, you've got the Yattering and the Jack, uh, the Yattering and Jack, which is a comedy right next to the Hills, the Cities, you know, which is amazing. So it's in Rawhead Rex, which is just a gore fest. So, so it was man. just such, it was like, go, it was just such variety and it was really liberating to find those stories. Now, you know, within this time, I'm, I would assume maybe this, the, 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 the book exchange was the opportunity of discovering, you know, cover art and this being, you know, like a main opportunity Earlier memories of picking something off of the cover art, and what was it that drew you in book wise? Well, here's the problem is that cover art's great. I love cover art. Uh, I'm a big advocate for the artist and, and their recognition. But back in the day, I preferred stuff that was like plain. There's a, um, a book I encountered when I was about six called Folklore legends and superstitions of great britain i think hmm. uh it was a reader's digest book but it was like a plain black cover with like a gold mask embossed on it and that was my speed that was really like Excellent. that book is amazing i like stuff that looked fancy um hmm. and one of the reasons was and i think this is 
hard if you're younger. If you're post Harry Potter, um, you know, back when I was going to high school, reading a book with a wizard in it, what a nerd. Like, you were a geek. <laughs> and some of that was my own shame about it. Like, like I would hide anything that was sci-fi or fantasy or look too weird when my friends came over because I didn't want to be weird. I didn't want to be like a nerd. <laughs> and now it's like, you know, everyone reads about a boy wizard. I'm like, really? Like, do that yeah. in 1981. It is not cool. <laughs> um, like, I think Lord of the Rings was the first book I was caught reading in public with that stuff with like a fantasy cover um, because it seemed respectable. Um, and I didn't even like Lord of the Rings, um, like the Hobbit. But uh, anyway, okay. so like, so, you know, but so for me, it was like, really, that stuff was shameful. But I was reading a shit ton of it. You know, I was reading all those choose your own adventures and those, uh, uh, what were they, uh, endless quest books and twist of plots and all that stuff I loved. Uh, but I just didn't want anyone to catch me with it. Man, now, even uh, like something that's that's often I think touchy is you know when people kind of get into the aspect of the book was better. You you see a film apt adaptation or maybe a television adaptation. Have you had anything where you've watched possibly the film adaptation of a book and realized that you liked the the imagining better than the original source material? Oh yeah, Jaws. I mean, a hundred percent. Jaws is just yeah. not a very good book. Um, it's like, listen, it, 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 it sold more books than I have collectively. Um, so, I mean, you can't argue with success, but it's not good. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's the whole subplot with like, um, oh God, I can't remember his name, but the Richard Dreyfus character oh. sleeping with oh, okay. Brody's wife. And there's a whole mafia thing being involved with real estate on Amity. And like, you know, it's just boring. Um, mm. And the book is just infinitely, infinitely better. Uh, I mean, sorry, the movie is just right. infinitely, infinitely better. Um, okay. But yeah, that to me is the biggest, the biggest one. And I, I, I mean, and, and a great choice. I mean, one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, it's never been something that I've read the book because I have often heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, same with, and somebody mentioned in the chat too, with Jurassic Park, that was something else where I've always wanted to pick it up and I've always wanted to dig in and it just kind of feels like it's a collective thing. I'm like, ah, yeah. I, I oh, would yeah. stick with the, with the, the imagining. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I went through a big Michael Crichton phase. It was around when I was going through like a big Clive Cussler phase. Um, oh, okay. And it's like, I think you, I think you read nine Clive Cussler books in a row when you're a kid and you realize they're all kind of the same book, but I really, <laughs> yeah. like, I really love underwater stuff. So yeah. I was really big on that, but uh, no, but Clive, Cus I mean, like I'm trying to think I, or Michael Crichton, I feel like Jurassic Park is a better movie. But again, it's Spielberg, you know? But I mm, feel like, yeah. it's a good book, but I feel like the movie is better. Um, mm -hmm. Although I will say the Andromeda Strain, I'll take the book any day, man. Robert Wise is oh, an shit. amazing director, but that is a snoozy, snoozy movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, and kind of continuing into this, you know, like transitions, uh, horror store and, you know, this being worked into a, a, a film of, of sorts or, or a series of sorts. Uh, you've mentioned before, as far as having the finale intentionally difficult to be able to film yeah. if anybody ever took this on. Uh, has there ever been something, you know, where you were familiar with the source material and you heard that they were making a movie and you were wondering how the hell are they going to be able to transition this into film? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we were talking about True Grit a minute ago. I will not make a True Grit movie. <laughs> okay. um, I won't because the book is, is told in first person by Maddie. And yeah. the, the sort of archaic King James Bible language she uses is her sort of internal voice. It's not how the characters were actually speaking. It's her relating this. And, and I just don't see any way they can put that on screen without making it seem like everyone talked like a dum-dum. Yeah, um, right. You know, everyone's got the stiffest diction. And I'm, I'm not interested. Hard pass. Okay. The book is amazing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to see the movies. Okay. All right. And if you I, like I the movies, that. that's great. I just sure. never want to go there. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. trying to think. Something, <laughs> something, well, you know, I mean, I still, I still will go to my death. Uh, I was a big fan of the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings animated movie. That was one of the early movies you could rent on VCRs back in the early 80s. And okay. I will all, I never want to rewatch it. But to me, um, uh, the end of Helm's Deep in the Ralph Bakshi movie, I prefer to the Peter Jackson oh, one. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry. Uh, it's, now, mem I mean, it's my memories. We're uh, like,
like, were you a fan of the Peter Jackson movies, or oh, yeah, was it just them. that these original no, no, no. adaptations? Okay, no, gotcha. no, I love the Peter Jackson. I'll rewatch them all the time. There's a friend of mine. She used to. Um, I'm, I'm really upset, actually. She used to do a marathon of them right around New Year's, and she stopped because of COVID. And I'm like, you know, this is when we hold on to our traditions tighter. Oh. Um, you know, oh, you, you, yeah, more right. people are going to church. More people need to be having their annual Lord of the Rings marathon right now. And she just didn't listen. And so okay. that's been a big blow for me. Okay. Okay. Now uh, this next, it can be for film or if it's, if it's, you know, not too difficult, even for books, actually, preferably three sequences that are just forever ingrained in your brain. May they have been something that just haunted you forever, whether it was disgusting uh, very sad, uh, traumatic. What comes to mind as far as three sequences, or if you're if you're thinking something, film in three books. scenes. Yeah. Um, yep. Let's come back to that in a second because I can get them, but I'm going to sit here in silence for a second. But I can think while we. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, okay. So uh, no, I actually I, I can think of a couple. Okay. So one is um, no, 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 no. Let's let's go into the next one. And I'll, I'll come back. I will answer this. It's just going to take Perfect. Me a few minutes. Perfect. Okay. I dig that. Um, now, something as far as real life, a fear you had uh, shared a couple, a few years ago here on Twitter, you kind of gave in this thread of a story of when you were nine years old and a very rational fear. Uh, what comes to mind as far as uh, any, anything from, from, you know, may it be sci-fi or horror um, that impulsed a irrational fear on you? when you were young, you, you didn't really have it until, you know, you read this or you watched this and you're like, God damn it, oh, this is yeah, with me yeah. forever. Yeah, um, okay, a couple of things. One is um, Dawn of the Dead. I will <laughs> never, ever, ever stand in front of elevator doors when they open anymore. <laughs> like I always stand to the side oh, that's when the zombies come in. Um, poltergeist, we had two big awesome. oak trees in our backyard and I had no fears of them until I saw that movie. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, I really, um, there was an issue of Fangoria with um, the shot from Friday the 13th part two of, um, of oh my God, Mrs. Voorhees' head in um, Adrian King's refrigerator. And uh, man, I really, that there was something so gross about that. It really upset me on a really visceral level. <laughs> and I started getting really freaked out by the inside of, um, uh, refrigerators, weirdly enough. Oh, oh and man. Then, like getting trapped in a refrigerator. That was always one of these things. And I guess it happened a lot to kids. There's this great what? movie. Well, you know, that used to be the big thing. You, you get these uh, warning movies when you're a kid of like, don't play in refrigerators in the junkyard because kids were getting trapped in them and locked and suffocating. I don't know oh, how many times oh. this happened, but there's oh a great God. nuclear movie called Lady Bird, Lady Bird um, from the 60s, uh, which is really, really grim that features that. But even then, I was just scared of, of getting trapped in a refrigerator or a confined space because of that. Those those scare films. Um, Man. Yeah. Okay. It was now, a lot for me. You oh, know, with, the with... other thing was, oh, I was just going to say, one thing that really grossed me out is I read the Mad Magazine parody of the exorcist years before i was allowed to see the exorcist <laughs> okay but um i can't remember who the artist was on this one but uh the puke was so disgusting <laughs> and it really like, <laughs> grossed me out for years to come uh snot and puke like it was just like it, it just had this visceral revulsion <laughs> Okay. Now, with, within these interests, you know, may it be something that you were reading or an author that you discovered or, you know, a set of, of films that were coming out. Uh, has, has your interest in, you know, things spooky ever, you know, pushed way too far? Like you've gotten to a point where maybe it was a subgenre or it was, you know, a particular set where it's like, I'm just not comfortable with this. I don't, I don't want to be here right now. No. I mean, you know, uh, not really. I mean, there's stuff I know I don't want to see. I don't want to ever see Cannibal Holocaust, oh. like the famous landmark film, but it's just not for me. Um, okay. And so there's stuff I'll avoid. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, I mean, in general, you know, um, I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I think Shinya Tsukamoto is an amazing filmmaker and that's, you know, his stuff gets super bleak and super body horror and extreme. Um, no, not really. Um, even I on your grave. I mean, I was glad I saw it. You know, I saw it when I was a teenager. It had a reputation. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, you know, I'm glad I've got that one under my belt. I'll probably never watch it again. I've got no desire right. to, but, you know, right. I, I, I like knowing where this stuff comes from. Oh, and I've never seen, someone just mentioned Human City. I've never seen them. I just don't have the interest. There's an, yeah. there's an element of edge, of sort of adolescent edge lord to the Human Centipede movies that really turns me <laughs> off. And, um, <laughs> So I'll probably never watch them um, yeah. <laughs> because I just know they're not for me. And, you know, people who like them, they don't want to hear me complaining about them. You know, they're, they're, they're enjoying it. So they don't, right. they don't want my sour grapes. Right. Yeah. You know, and it, it just made me think of, uh, you know, with, within the innocence of being young and having friends and maybe it being a weekend, everybody's, you know, getting together for whatever reason, uh, you know, some of my friends wanted to introduce, you know, things like Faces of Death oh. or, you know, some yeah. of these other movies where it's like, I'm just trying to have, you know, maybe some Coke and some pizza. I don't want to sit here through this shit. <laughs> yeah. No, and the, those are ones that, like, I really consciously avoided as well. Like, I just yeah. had no interest. Um, you know, it's the, the few, few times I've encountered that kind of real life carnage has just been so upsetting and awful. Um, mm-hmm. I, I got no interest in visiting it as entertainment. Sure. Um, I appreciate that. Okay, so I think I've got two of the three scenes. I think I've got three. So uh, awesome from books. So yeah. So one is um, it's sort of a tie, and it's a bit of a cheat, but they're both from the books of blood. And there's a moment in Rawhead Rex, the Clive Barker story, where the monster pees on a priest, and that always stuck with me because I was like, "Holy shit! You can do this in a book!" Like it made sense within the context of the book, like in the story. I was like, "Yeah, this this makes sense." But I was like, "I had no idea you could do that," and that really blew my mind. <laughs> also, in the books of blood, in the hills, the city, when um, the the people form the giant monster, that always really stuck with me, and I was oh, always yeah, just okay. like. It's such an absurd image, but it's pulled off with such conviction that I was just always in awe of it. Um, then there was a um, a book I loved um, that probably, ah, oh man, it, it wouldn't pass muster today, but it was called uh, "The Park Is Mine," and it was a it was a men's adventure thing where uh, um, Vietnam that you know, they were always the bad guys in these books from the 70s and 80s. He decides that he's going to just take over Central Park. And um, he does. And he's rigged it with booby traps. And the cops try and he just kills a lot of cops. And it's, it's, I loved it. I mean, I must have read it 30 times as a teenager. There was just something so (laughs) antisocial and amazing about it. And it also was an early example of that kind of competency porn that you see in stuff like the Bourne movies or like Taken, you know, or the John Wick movies. Um, and I really like watching people work like to build things and, and make things. Um, and so there's a sequence in that where he sort of like um, declares the park his and then you've got like 30 pages of just cops falling into <laughs> sharp pits full of sharp mistakes <laughs> and stepping on landmines and having their and I just I don't know why it's so antisocial but that was something that I read over and over and over again and then the third one I'm going to say is there's a movie bit and a um so the book one is I will always 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 I don't really like Salem's Lot the book um I loved it as a kid I must have oh, read okay. Salem's Lot a dozen times and I loved it and I did a big Stephen King reread where I read everything in order as an adult mm-hmm. and and wrote about it for tour and Salem's Lot was just one that didn't hold up for me it, it wasn't my book anymore you know um okay it, it, listen there's nothing against liking it I loved it but rereading it as an adult I was like yeah this I, I see the flaws here more and they outweigh the the good stuff in it for me just for me okay but okay. as a kid the scene where um oh god I always getting confused Barlow and Stryker I think it's Barlow mm-hmm. who's the vampire yeah. um or maybe it's Stryker I can't um, where, <laughs> Marlo. He attacks, where he attacks Mark Petrie's family um, was oh, always yeah. like just re- because it's sort of this big action scene after this long, long build up in that book, and that that sequence always sort of like got me, um, and so I'd always like reread it, like building towards that. Uh, but Mark Petrie, I think, is a big hero for a lot of people who are sort of nerds, like I was. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> he's one of the first examples of like a geeky kid, but like being geeky has like made him better. Um, you know, it's, it's made him able to survive the vampire apocalypse. It hasn't made him a loser. Um, but there's two movie moments that I sort of like keep writing and rewriting in my books. And one of them is the end of Helm's Deep from the Ralph Bakshi oh, animated Lord of the okay. Rings. Seeing Gandalf ride into the rescue in that is like, man, it, it just gives me such love of that moment where someone rides to the rescue. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just really love that. And the other <laughs> one is, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but the end of Ken Faree's story and the choice he makes at the end of Dawn of the Dead is always made a huge, huge impression on me. Um, you love know, that. and I, I just like, yeah, and I just feel like, and it's one of the reasons reasons and I don't, honestly if you haven't seen the original dawn of the dead just just go watch it just stop watching this but um <laughs> I, I can't do an unhappy ending in my books like maybe it's qualified maybe you know people aren't entirely in one piece they've been through a lot they might some of them might be dead but i if i wind up with some bleak nihilistic ending in a book it just means i haven't gotten to the end of the story yet and i need to keep going <laughs> and i think a lot of that comes from dawn of the dead where it's just, um, you know, you get Ken Faree and you're like, man, you, you know, yeah, 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 I get it, horror. Everything's bleak and nihilistic. And you're like, oh, no, he is not going to go out. Like, he can't. He's too alive. Yeah. Uh, and it <laughs> always just it was such a moment for me. Yeah. I, and it's, I, it's sort I of right in there with that. the. Thing. I mean, it's sort of right in there with um, it's Sally Hardesty, right, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah. 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 It, 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 with her getting away, sorry, spoiler alerts for a movie from the early 70s. 70s yeah. um, but like, <laughs> she gets away. She gets away. Clean. Like, it's, it's, it, she wins. Um, mm -hmm. And so those things really make a difference to me. They really made an impact. Now, uh, another another aspect of your writing I want to touch on just as far as, you know, the prep that you put into things. You've you've mentioned with uh, We Sold Our Souls that, you know, getting into metal bands and, you know, really kind of embodying that whole embrace and myself being a huge fan of heavier music and, and horror movies as well. I, I, I just wanted to ask as far as what particular bands or, or songs really were striking to you? Maybe they were from uh, early memory or things that were introduced to you just for the prep of this book. Oh, uh, like like metal? I mean, yeah. you know, uh, so looking, I, I did a really stupid thing, which was I was looking for a way into metal and like, you know, cause I, I need that song that I'm going to be like, oh, I can listen to this over and over. And then I'll listen to the song on the album after it. And then, you know, um, I'll go from there. And uh, I couldn't find it. And I was listening, I was listening. And um, I finally listened to the title track on Black Sabbath's first album, which is oh, the yeah. first the first metal song on the first real metal album. And um, <laughs> uh, it, it was, that was my way in. And um, it was oh, dumb man. of me not to start there. You know, um, I listened to, so Devin Townsend, the Canadian uh, metal musician, mm -hmm. I listened, he had an album that came out when I started writing this book called Transcendence. I must, have, I can't listen to it anymore. I must've listened to it a hundred <laughs> times writing that book. Um, uh, uh, sleep, uh, dope smoker. I can't listen to that album. I'm also listening to it a hundred times writing this book. Oh I, man! Uh, I just tried to re-listen to. Um, hold on, I want to make sure I'm getting the tracks because I, I sort of blotted it out of my mind. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, yeah, gray skies and electric light. Can't listen to that. Woods of Eats. I can't listen to that anymore because <laughs> okay. I listen to it so many times. Um, the two I can still listen to that I listened to a couple hundred times writing the book is um, uh, Wolves in the Throne Room. I listened to um, a, one of their albums over and over again writing this book. Okay. Um, and, and I can still listen to them. And also uh, Mastodon's Leviathan album. Like I can Man. still listen to that, but I listened to that a zillion times writing that book. That's, so a lot of epic, a lot of very, yeah. uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, well-deserved place, you know, to, for, to be for, for inspiration. So I, I well, love that. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, like, like one of the things I love about metal is that um, there's room for Slayer. There's room for Metallica. I, you know, they are undeniably great at what they do. Um, you know, I really have a soft spot for, like, Bad Brains. Cannibal Corpse is the one band. 
messes me up. I can't do it. I can't do it. Oh, I'll man. listen to a Cannibal Corpse song and a minute in, I'm like, get me out of this <laughs> dimension. <laughs> um, but like, there's, there's a place for all that stuff. There's a place rational that, and, and for some people that is their happy place. But sure. for me, what really I fell in love with is covers of like fucking desert landscapes <laughs> with like aliens on them and like <laughs> black pyramids <laughs> with eyes with you know and wolves and like vikings and dragons and these this sort of like epic metal that was like very power metal you know very uh man of war very um you know i never quite gro groove to like iron maiden but i like where they're coming from like every song it's like in this song i'm a roman legionary in this song i am a <laughs> satanist in this song i am a viking um that sort of epic storytelling and that 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 desire to remake the world into a place that's more exciting for you to live in yeah. i think is something i really admire in metal and you don't see that in almost any other maybe a little bit in, maybe a little bit in some hip hop but not really like i feel like hip hop a lot of it is so um so values looking at this world and i think so much metal is like let's make a different world and i sure. will say um you know maybe like, like psychedelic rock kind of but really metal and classical music to me are the two that are like we're making another dimension here. Come and join mm -hmm. us. It's so much cooler. Yeah. And I admire that. <laughs> now with classical, I know that you've mentioned that in different interviews. Was this early memories as far as like a big council record player and, you know, your parents or grandparents, was that something that was always playing or was that something that came a little bit no, later in life to you? We were, we were a real music free household. We really like, my parents had an album, had an album collection, of like 12 albums. There was a Bob, uh, a Bob, Bob Newhart comedy album, a, awesome. a, a copy of the Broadway cast recording of Applause starring Lauren Bacall, which is the musical version of All About Eve. Um, and then like, Tennessee Ernie Ford. And like, I listen to that Bob Newhart and applause a lot. Like I can sing most of that applause album. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, yeah, we weren't really a big music family. Um, that oh, was like friends okay. at school mostly. But the one thing we did have is every year, Charleston has this big arts festival called Spoleto. And I would have to go and see a lot of classical music with my mom who, who liked it a lot. Um, and I hated it. <laughs> uh, and, but then two, two of my sisters were dancers, um, like ballet dancers, and, and and one of them really went for it. Um, and uh, oh. they did uh, the Firebird and um, uh, Carmina Burana, and those two blew my mind. And one of my my much replayed tapes in high school was uh, Carmina Burana. I mean, I listened oh, to that man. thing a lot. Um, and, wow. and, you know, and that's, that's like a gateway drug to like the planets and, you know, a bunch of other stuff and Shostakovich and Prokofiev and all that. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And then the other, the other gateway drug for me was, um, uh, well, there were two classical music gateway drugs. One was, um, there was a movie in the late eighties, uh, by Takashi Kitano, the Japanese filmmaker called, uh, Violent Cop. And it, it really blew my mind at the time. It's a really stripped down minimal movie. Um, but I think they play a piece by Satie in it. And I remember reading like Satie in, in, uh, in uh, a review. And so I got really into Satie. And then that led me to a bunch of other like sort of modernist and minimalist composers. And then, and this is really nerdy to admit. Um, so I, I used to read tons and tons of theater magazines, like Tulane Drama Review and all this, The Village Voice. Because all these libraries I was sitting in waiting for someone to pick me up would have copies of these. And like, this stuff would blow my mind. I'd be like, oh my God, in New York, the ridiculous theater and Robert Wilson and the Worcester, what are these nuts? Oh, and I, I was big in theater. And um, when I can, a friend of mine and I really, really worshiped Robert Wilson. And Robert Wilson <laughs> was very, very famous for doing really visually extravagant, but very slow productions, like where it would take someone like three hours to walk across the stage, <laughs> but they would do, 
I know it's nuts, but they would do things <laughs> like, uh, you know, they'd have a giant cat walk across stage and you just see it's like legs that were made of these like 40 foot columns of fur <laughs> and like just wild stuff. And he did the opera with Philip Glass, Einstein on the beach. And um, okay. this friend and I were obsessed with it. We, you know, we never listened to it. We, we could catch snatches of it. We could never hear the whole recording and we could read about it. And it sounded like our kind of thing, like really off-putting and minimalist and aggressive. And, um, and, and you know, it's like a, it's a, it's a multi-hour opera. I think it's like six hours. And the Whoa. year I moved to New York to go to college here, it was revived with a lot of the members of the original cast in it. And oh. Philip Glass was conducting and Robert Wilson restaged it. And so my friend Sean came to New York and we bought our tickets and we went there. And the opening piece in that, um, there's a moment, it starts, I mean, this sounds terrible because it starts with the chorus <laughs> counting and they count for a really long time. And, um, and then the music, <laughs> kick, the music kicks in at like seven minutes into this counting and it takes off. And I remember sitting with Sean in that theater. And when that took off, I felt like I was in a fucking UFO. And it was like, <laughs> I, I, I really felt like, like this, is, this, this is where my life begins. Like this is, I've been in South Carolina all my life. I have been in these boundaries and I got no more excuses. From here on out, if it's wow. something I don't have access to, that's on me. Because <laughs> right now the walls are down and I can go anywhere and do anything. Um, and that, yeah, it was, a, so yeah. So I've always been a, a big fan of like really <laughs> austere minimalist <laughs> opera like that. Now, now, were you ever involved in theater as far as in school yeah. or take any? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I am um, a, a lot of the stuff about Mark in how to sell a haunted house is my stuff. Uh, oh we, oh we, shit. Okay. Yeah. So it's funny. I had this, friend Ryan Ducing in, uh, in high school. I did all the young theater, man. I, I would say in a musical where I played a singing mouse as a kid. I played Dopey and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, I, did you have lines? No, Dopey doesn't have lines. Um, okay, well, yeah. there's been versions that I've seen where really? Dopey has lines and I'm like, that's not this revisionism. This isn't. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, no, I just no, no, wondered because no. I was like, that's, "You guys that's cast this role and then give him lines." He doesn't talk. Okay. Oh my uh, god! I, I bet there's some drama behind the scenes there too. They're like, <laughs> like there's a mom who's like, or a dad who's like, "My son is going to get lines as Dopey." <laughs> Dopey doesn't like. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear yeah. that. Do you know how many productions my son has been in? He's going to have lines. Um, but I did all oh, that stuff. God. And then I fell in with this, Ryan and I fell in with this adult theater company called Chopstick that was actually really good. Um, mm -hmm. It was doing wild stuff. And um, so we were doing a lot of theater. And there was a theater um, festival called in your own right. And it was like, it was like Southeast regional and like high school students would write a play, like a one act play and perform it and direct themselves and they compete against each other. And uh, Ryan and I wanted to do this play and um, we couldn't because I had a lot of problems with my school. Uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time as Abby in my best friend's exorcism, just at war with the administration. And um, they were like, mm. no, we, we, you're gr and, and they were like, your grades just aren't good enough and you aren't allowed to participate in extracurricular activities. And so I was like, cool. There's nothing in the rules that says we have to be affiliated with the school. So Ryan and I formed our own theater company, the two of us. And um, we did a show and it was about a serial killer visiting his psychiatrist. Um, it, was, it was ridiculous. But when we went to Man. the competition, our school was furious that we were doing this, but they couldn't get us thrown out of the competition. And um, yeah, someone just asked about the bodybuilders and best friends exorcism. Yes, they're called the Power Brothers. Uh, they used to tour. Um, but anyway, and so <laughs> we realized when we got there Sick. that every other theater company the, all these other kids were doing a show that was like about drinking and driving or don't do drugs. And we were doing this thing about a serial killer that was like a comedy. And, um, and we won. And our school was furious. And um, <laughs> oh, so the next, because we beat their team. And so the next year we had two other friends, Alan and Kathy Lindemeyer join us and Alan Hudson. And um, we did a show called Breakdance Explosion that was completely nonsense there was no plot in it it started out with two teenagers pondering their like unplanned pregnancy before they're visited by bonzo the aborting clown <laughs> and it ended with a, <laughs> a, a condensed version of hamlet that was staged on an escargot farm and um 
and uh, it was it was you know it was just ridiculous, and um, <laughs> and it was so I mean there was like there was like a point where I played a, a womb and I had a little womb costume and I would roll around in it on stage, and we beat them again. Uh, we beat everyone with this thing and our school was mortified <laughs> and um we wound up doing a run of that at a theater downtown um and like it was a blast and then we did a version of the glass menagerie the four of us called the bass menagerie where instead of glass figurine she collects bass um and <laughs> so yeah we did a few of that and then i went off to college and did a couple of shows uh house of corn uh which people who read how to sell a haunted house would uh would would recognize sure. and um okay. i did i joined a radical puppet collective uh and was part of a radical puppet collective for a little while um and and oh, yeah that's really based on reality wow and, and no boston kidding. is boston is a big puppet town because all the big political puppeteers come out of bread and puppet in southwestern vermont and boston's the next big city you hit after you leave there and so Boston's full of these like puppet collectives or used to be in the nineties. Uh, but yeah, so theater was really my, my background more than anything. Uh, so, oh, wow, uh, Jesus. There, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of different things that are coming. I have all this yeah. shit written and I'm like trying not to falter off because I don't want to be. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I'm night totally <laughs> digressing. I apologize. No, no, no. I, I, I love it. I don't, I'm not going to interrupt. I, I love that. I, uh, I, I'm just having all these other things that are popping up now where I'm like, yeah, I yeah. need to get back to this. But um, just one last thing, yeah. and this will, you know, dig into uh, your latest book. The, the Puppet Collective, what, what exactly is that? I, I'm not familiar. I don't know what that, what, what would that look like? We were, there was three or four of us, about four of us. And um, we, they, they did all the heavy lifting. I came in late and was just sort of like the intern. Um, but they made these giant, gorgeous puppets. I mean, they were beautiful. Um, they taught me stilt walking. I, I'd already knew juggling and fire oh. eating from some other people I'd learned. Um, but they really taught stilt walking and all this stuff. And so we'd wear these <laughs> puppets. You, you wore puppets and they were huge and uh, amazing. And we did really political, uh, in your face kind of punk shows. We did a show um, at an elementary school it was all about the Pinochet regime in South America and sort of the torture of political dissidents. Wow. And we were like, this is what we do, man. We're not changing it because just because our audience are all in third grade. Like, um, and and the school was actually <laughs> fine with it. They were like, yeah, okay, whatever. It was a pretty, it was a pretty liberal school. Um, but yeah, we did street shows. We did, we were in political protests. We, you know, we really, we did Hydro-Quebec shows, like anti-Hydro-Quebec. Like that was our, our jam. And um it was a blast. It was really, really fun. And, you know, there's something about making this stuff that was so much fun. Like, you know, some schmuck actor standing on the street doesn't get much attention. But once you put on one of these giant puppet outfits, man, everyone can't <laughs> stop scare, staring. Oh, man. That's, okay, so this is now now years later this is the quarantine we're bringing it back to a couple of years ago uh to where you start writing or you have uh a how to sell a haunted house you know in the in the works here um over the course of the pandemic is it pretty much that two years that you took as far as writing this book um and, and, and from start to finish what was kind of like a timeline for you yeah so i wrote the book pretty quickly and it sucked and I was really convinced that first draft was good. And um, it, it really, it, 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 it just, the, the last third was just, it was all about a puppet cult and it was like just not working. So then I, I threw it out in another draft that was radically different. And this one I knew wasn't working, but I, I finished it. I was like, this is the best I can do. And, and my editors were like, no. So then I did a third version and um, uh, the third, Third version is really smart. Uh, the third version of How to Sell a Haunted House is a really, really smart book. Uh, has a lot more marionettes in it, um, a lot of marionette stuff. And it was a more on target, but it still wasn't working. And so then I did a fourth version that I was like, I hate, I hate you to my editor. And then I hate <laughs> you to my other, my UK editor. And I was like, you guys suck. You have no taste. Uh, you're ruining this book, but I'm going to make these changes because you want me to compromise. And and that's the version of the book that's the one people are reading now. And um, it turned out to be the right version. So I was an idiot. Um, 
but you know, like I, I, you get so, I get so tunnel visioned on this stuff that I need people standing around me being like, this is dumb, dude. No, <laughs> like, like I, I, I want to get back to that puppet cult. Cause man, I had a, I had pages and pages of puppet cult <laughs> stuff, but uh, yeah, it's all gone. So I mean, someone's asking if Mark, can somebody, I just, someone's asking if Mark is ahead. me, not really, but every character's me. Like I just cannibalize my own childhood for this stuff, but Mark's based on a, on a Mark's based physically on a very good friend of mine who I loved and adored. He died way too young. And um, oh, wow. he was someone who just, who really uh, rocked my world. And um, mm -hmm. he was very Mark and he drove, he drove adults crazy. <laughs> and I was like, this man is God. <laughs> okay. Now, as far as this first draft now, and you kind of touched on this because you had said, you know, you get so infatuated, you've spent all of this time discarding, you you know, this first draft and saying, boy, this sucks. Like, is this hundreds of pages that you are tossing and saying, yeah. I, I need to start? Shit. Really? Yeah. yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah. Wow, but, you that's know, crazy. It, it's, it's, it's what you do, right? Like, like uh, if I was a better writer, I'd do it once. But because I'm, I got to do it over and over again. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mind that. Like, I... I get better the more I do it. So it's, it's fine with me, you know? It, it yeah. sucks, but it's fine. I, you know, I, I just think that there's both, you know, angles to that as far as somebody who's looking from the outside in, you know, how many people would take that on and, you know, see like, okay, I've got 200 pages that I need to cut, like, screw this thing. I'm done with this and I'm going to be on somewhere else. You know, I mean, there's, there's definitely something to say there as far as like, uh, screw oh. this. I'm going to, I'm going to dig back in and, and figure this shit out. Yeah. But that's doing theater because one of the things with theater is like, oh, no one okay. cares about your feelings. Like the show's yeah. got to work and it's gotta, it's gotta last two hours or whatever. You know what I mean? It's got a running time and it's got to work. And I've done enough shows that don't work. And, you know, you're out there being like, I really wanted to have all these lines and now I have to say them and I sound like an asshole and <laughs> no one in the audience cares. They want me to shut up. I want to shut up. Like, like, why didn't we fix this when we had time? Um, and so that made me really like, Touché. you know, realize that like, if I don't do that stuff, then you wind up sort of with your ass hanging out in public and you look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh god okay so you've mentioned much of this book uh being very much set in your aunt's house yeah. uh, uh when building this world you know what were initial things that came to mind you know maybe from earlier on or maybe you know a recent memory as far as things that you had to include in this if this is going to be your aunt's house you're going to have this in this book i have to do it justice by having what? Oh, I mean, you know, my aunt was a big crafter. Um, so crafts were a big thing. The carpets. Uh, I was a kid when I was over there. So I was always sitting on the floor. So I was really into the carpets there. Um, and, I, you know, it was just more like I wanted a place where I would be happy to hang out with in my imagination for a while. And I just that house had a really good vibe. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I really wish I'd been able to include, but I, I just couldn't do it justice is um <clears throat> Is, uh, is my aunt was deaf, and, or she passed away now. And, um, and watching her be a deaf person in a hearing world, I mean, none of her children were deaf. Um, and I don't think she had any friends who were deaf. Either. She might have had one or two, but, um, uh, you know, it was, it was really incredible to see her navigate the world. Um, and I remember really clearly when, when sort of um, cochlear implants technology got to the point where I think mm. she got cochlear implants or she may have gotten a hearing aid. I can't remember. Um, I remember she, you know, she had no idea some things like paper made a sound. It's, she was in her 60s at that point. Um, you know, wow. and, and she really, really, uh, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was something none of us even, I never even noticed she was deaf. I mean, she was deaf. But like, I, it wasn't like, oh my God, my aunt's deaf until I was well into a teenager life. You know, um, it was just who she was. And, mm. and, and that's a character I don't see in books a whole lot. And I'm sure they're out there. I just say maybe I'm not reading the right books. But I've always wanted to do justice to that. Mm. Um, and I, and I, I may not be the writer to do that, you know, um, because that's just such a different experience of mine. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny. I, um, someone was telling me that, that they liked my 
Christian characters in, in books because they're not all like buffoons. And, you know, one of the places that comes from is my aunt um, because she, um, she went to church pretty i mean i hate to say religiously it sounds like a terrible pun but for 15 yeah. years she didn't miss church <clears throat> and mm -hmm. it was 15 years when she was deaf like before she had a hearing aid or or anything she belonged to this one church for 15 years before she ever had a hearing aid and um and so that's faith man she went mm -hmm. and did church and wow. she wasn't you know she was sitting through the sermon but she was only following what she could lip read you know, and she never took classes or anything. She sort of figured it out on her own. Um, the, the, the singing, all that stuff was, was not geared towards her specifically, but it was important to her to be there and to participate. Uh, and I always have a lot of admiration wow. for that. Yeah, absolutely. Jeez. Uh, it, it, there's a lot to, uh, now, and if this is, you know, like a personal thing, like you know, by, by no means you can, you know, pass on it. But were you mentioning, did she have the opportunity as far as having that implant, like she while she did, was still living? She did very late in life. Uh, I think oh, the technology okay. got good. And from what I remember, and I have to <clears> double check <throat> with my mom, but I know that um, she might have gotten an infection or there was something wrong with it. And she wound up only being able to get one of her ears done. And that almost threw her off more. And I know that um, late life, it's sort of like she, she like her deafness increased uh, beyond mm -hmm. the point where it could be handled. And, and I don't know the exact, you know, medical stuff. Yeah, sure. I have to talk okay. to my mom again. But, but I do know that there was a period where she was able to hear uh, and then gradually that faded again. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, so as far as the book, you've, uh, you've mentioned in, in different air interviews and talking, uh, you know, about it, that this is the finale in your Charleston, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, s surrounding, you know, uh, a setting uh, as far as your books. Now, expanding from that and looking into, you've mentioned, you know, writing at different areas, you know, the East Coast, different things like that, someone that you're not familiar, what goes into your prep or uh, you know, research as far as creating these worlds that you're otherwise not familiar with? Um, it's stupid how much. I mean, like, so my next book, uh, <laughs> well, it's, good. It's, set, it's set in 1970 in St. Augustine, Florida, because I'm like, if I'm not in Charleston, I need to be in a southeastern coastal tourist town within driving distance of Charleston. Okay. Uh, but like I, I went down there for like 10 days and lived down there and, and did a lot of walking around and, and going out in the woods, which is a bad idea, man. They've got <laughs> these like black flies that just swarm you. Um, and oh, it was pretty oh, horrific. Um, and it's set in 1970. And like, um, I know like the months it's set in. So I read all the, the St. Augustine Herald, I think. But I read every newspaper for those months and like made notes and I've got the TV schedules and the weather charts and all that. Um, Shit. But I've wow. gotten a first draft of that book done and it needs so much work. Like I got to go back and, and redo so much stuff. Um, and a lot of it's background stuff that I just cheated on and I need to really sit there and make sure I know it all before I go in. It's got, it, it's, it's set in a home for unwed mothers and there's 16 girls in there and they they some come in and some come out and i just don't have enough info on all of them uh oh, you know i have some but man. so i've got i've got sketchy bios for like uh, i've got really intense bios for like six of them but like sketchy ones for the other 12 and so i need better ones for the other 12 before i, I don't know it's, this is so ridiculous that i require this level of like hand holding <laughs> for myself it's, it's not, it's no way to write a book. I, I mean, are we talking like, like a binder here where we have this character and you have maybe drawings written out, you know, things that they've gone through as far as uh, just personal reference to yourself or is this things that you're going to, you know, kind of divulge into it? Yeah, I've got a, it's stuff for myself. I do notebooks and I also, I use Scrivener, uh, which is a process and uh, a, a piece of software. And so I've got tons of notes in that. Um, but hmm. like with the Joyner family and how to sell a haunted house, I needed to know that family all the way because a family's back backstory, like 99% of a family is backstory. Um, and so with that, um, I just counted for someone they were asking, I have a year by year history of the family written. Um, and, and it, it's 71 <laughs> pages. Uh, and so like, oh, man. you know, and, and, 
and some of that's in the book and some of it isn't, you know, I right. mean, but, but I need to know it or else I'm just not going to be convincing. Damn. Wow. That is insane. So something with this book that stuck out and this, you know, by, by no, I have to, you know, be transparent and saying I haven't read every one of your books that you've had, but as far as Mark as a character seemed a lot more relevant in your writing than most of your, your writing as far as a male character and really sure. kind of getting into a backstory and, you know, further information. What was it about that character that really had your attention as far as I want to include more details about him? Yeah, well, I mean, I wanted to write about brothers and sisters. You know, my, my sisters and I are all trying to figure out what our family looks like when our parents die. Uh, you know, I don't want to be morbid or anything, but both our mom and our dad are in their late 80s. Um, you know, they will be dying, you know, so sooner rather than later. Um, uh, sooner if I have anything to say about it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's terrible. <laughs> uh, so, um, but so I wanted to write about siblings, um, you know, and, um, I, 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 I also, I really enjoy the version of dude that Mark is like just loud, obnoxious people who make messes, um, <laughs> and let other people clean them up. Um, I, I, I don't enjoy them in real life, but they're fun to watch and they're fun to write. Um, yeah. You know, I love writing assholes in my books. Like Heather's <laughs> one of my favorite characters from Final Girl Support Group. Um, I, I just like writing a jerk is fun. Um, and so writing Mark was a lot of fun. Um, okay. And okay. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so definitely that's that's where that came from. Okay. And And so as far as with the book, you know, like my intention with this was it still being new, I didn't really want to get into spoilers. I sure. didn't want to get into the end, into the, it, it's, it's so much more fun, you know, in a day and age, you know, now where you can download anything at the fingertips, you can do that, you know, for people to kind of hear a little bit more about it and maybe some tantalizing things. The last detail that I wanted to touch on this book here uh, was the squirrel nativity. Mm -hmm. How the hell does this come up? Where, was there any sort of like direct inspiration? <laughs> Where yeah. the hell does this thing so, come from? So I'm just making sure I have it right. Yeah, so there is um, a writer who runs, uh, who's part of a bookstore called uh, Nowhere Bookstore, and it's down in Texas, uh, Jenny Lawson. And um, I've done a few Zoom interviews with her during the pandemic, and, uh, and, and I think she's a really funny writer, but she loves taxidermy. And so in these interviews, there's always all this taxidermy behind her. And I'm like, man, I got to use that for something. <laughs> and, um, and I think all of us have seen those things of like, it's, it's a taxidermy kittens at a tea party or um, squirrels or something like that. And so I was like, well, yeah, why wouldn't it be a nativity? Like, what, why, would, why wouldn't a very... <laughs> Why wouldn't a person who expresses themselves with arts and crafts, who is intrigued by the art of taxidermy, and who is quite religious, um, not try to make a nativity out of taxidermied squirrels? I, I would in that position. Oh um, and so, yeah, I mean, what, you know, tax, <laughs> you, you can, I've seen all kinds of nativities. I've seen Disney character nativities. Why not taxidermied squirrels? <laughs> It was it was certainly a point where uh, you know you just have certain things where you read it and you you wonder if maybe uh, you you just your eyes had kind of filled with a tear and maybe you misread it uh, and to go back a couple of times I'm like what in the hell is this uh, and and what an image it it really uh, computed into my brain there uh, absolutely <laughs> awesome <laughs> I love that I love yeah that. we're so, we're actually we're actually pitching this in L A right now um, and and that's a part where a lot of development people are like these squirrels um so how, are they gonna be in the movie and we're always like the squirrels are the star of the movie i, I had seen on every poster right in the center with baby jesus squirrel and Harry and joseph squirrels on either side oh my god absolutely ridiculous I, I i love that i love that and and the, the book all in all is so much fun and all well, of thanks. your stuff is always so fun uh you know and just the spirit that you have, it's very relevant in why, you know, all of your books are the way that they are. So, uh, you know, myself and everybody else really appreciates your work, man. Oh, yeah. And, uh, this has been absolutely great. This has been no, fun. And, 
thank you guys. Thank you for the support and thanks to everyone for reading. Like it's, it's, I love my job, but it would be very different if no one read my book. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so no, no, I really appreciate it. It's nice to, to do something I like and it seems to make people happy. Resonates. Absolutely. One last thing really quick here before I, I let you go. Uh, I just wanted to conjure up something, you know, as far as bringing us back to the days of the video shop. And mm. I wanted to come up with a little bit, uh, something of the, of the likes of uh, a Friday night at the Hendrix. So, you know, we went out to the video shop and you picked one of these movies just based solely off of the cover art. We're going to bring it home with all of our friends and uh, we're watching it. So, you know, uh, starting off with maybe a nice horror comedy, if you will. Uh, we had these two movies yeah. that we got to, we got down to them. Which one would you choose? We have Wacko oh, and yeah. we have Pandemonium. Oh, I don't know if you've seen Pandemonium. either of these. So actually Pandemonium has a very special place in my heart. Um, oh man. Uh, my Miss Mary in Southern Book Club is based on my grandmother. And um, we were having lunch one day when she died. And, um, you know, and so... Uh, as they were dealing with her dying, I got sent across the street to the Scoggins house because I was like nine or 10, I think. Uh, and it was like really intense. And um, I remember uh, it was the middle of the afternoon and cable was on and pandemonium was just about to begin. So I sat there watching pandemonium as I watched like ambulances go by <laughs> the street going to our house. And then oh, and left no. with their sirens off with my, my poor grand, my granny Hunter on it um, and oh, watching no. Pandemonium. And I always, and, I, and I, I thought it was the funniest movie I'd ever seen in my life. And I rewatched it about four years ago and like 10 minutes in, I turned it off. I was like, I, you <laughs> know, I'd rather have my memory of this. So <laughs> okay. Pandemonium is definitely what I'd pick. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Also, yeah, that's... Wacko is not, Wacko is pretty painful. Yeah, there's there's a, there's some certainly uh, you know kind of dodgy uh, you know moments in that, but you know there's also some fun. And and, and yeah. regarding the story you were telling, uh, you know, I, I wasn't laughing at the the, the scenario, okay. much less uh, you know I loving the, the movie. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a we have a creature feature mm -hmm. here. So you you go. We have the last two here that you've picked out of a pile, and we have mosquito. Or uh -huh. slugs. Which one of these creature features oh, would you bring on home for the weekend? Uh, and that's mosquito, right? That's not mansquito. Yep. <laughs> no, it's not mansquito. I, I would go with I, I would go with mosquito that. just because slugs um, repulses me on a. a pro <laughs> yeah, actually, you know what? I'd go with slugs because isn't that based slugs. on the Sean Hudson book? You know, I couldn't tell you that part. It, it is gross. Yeah. and it is uh, very grimy. Uh, yeah, you know, a, as far as a creature feature. Yeah. I would avoid it because of the griminess, but it is based on a Sean Hudson book, and I think it features slugs with fangs, so maybe slugs. I love it. I love it. All right, one last matchup here. Yep. You know, we're going to go for maybe something a little bit, uh, you know, maybe something along the lines of a Wendigo horror, if mm -hmm. you will. We have a newer, uh, The Ritual, based off of a, a, a book mm -hmm. there, uh, The Ritual, and then we have Frostbiter. I don't know if you've ever heard of this bad boy. No. Uh, well, this I was the 90s, 1994. I'd go with Frostbiter. Frostbiter. Winter horror is my favorite horror. Winter it is absolutely horror. that. Um, that. That brings you, you know, a little bit of a cover art there, and we're drawn beautiful. in. I think it'd be a good good weekend. Grady, and, this has been absolutely awesome. And can I just man. say one quick thing? <laughs> sure. Someone just sure. asked about Super Scary Haunted Home School, and there are new episodes that have been edited, and they are coming in February, and more are coming later. So. It Beautiful. Thanks for awesome. having me, dude. Awesome. This has been great, man. Thank you so Take much. Care. You have a good night, Grady. You too. Take care. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, be, 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 be. Lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.